Good afternoon and welcome to today's first STAMP uh, webinar. Uh, today I'm Gretchen Amusen and I'm presenting with Jenny Beer and we are delighted to be sharing this presentation with you. We will be presenting for approximately one hour and then we will be happy to answer your questions. And we just wanted to say a few words about who we are. Uh, I was trained as a professional musician and have worked in the nonprofit sector, both in the United States and in France, running a chamber music festival, creating a fundraising program for a symphony orchestra, and initiating an extensive international relations program for the Paris Conservatoire. All along the way, I've chaired several European working groups on the Bologna process and higher education in music, on the music profession, and most recently on entrepreneurship in music. And while I have not ever created my own enterprise, I can say that I have often developed new projects and initiatives, and that in these I have um, made use of the skills that we are going to talk about today. And um, I'm Jenny Beer. I, um, like Gretchen, also trained as a musician, um, but went straight into uh, project management. So worked for various orchestras and arts organisations. Um, I was always very interested in the education and community side of things. Um, and for the past, past few years, I've worked exclusively on a social enterprise called Drumworks, which I set up along with two other people as an enterprise that functions independently. So I'm going to be drawing on my experience of setting up that enterprise in what I'm talking about today. So, starting from the beginning, why, why is entrepreneurship important for you as a musician? Um, and how can it be relevant to your professional life, even if you don't intend to set up your, set up your own company? A recent study by the European Union's Creative Europe suggests that successful employment for those working in the performing arts and audiovisual sector across all of Europe depends largely on two factors. The first is an ability to manage the so-called digital shift, ensuring your presence on multiple digital media and social media platforms, and, large, and mastering ever-evolving technological advances. Secondly, and largely as a result of the economic crisis, a tendency for employment to be project-based and freelance. In other words, you will be called upon to self-manage, to organize and run projects, be they your own career, a festival, an ensemble, a touring network, music school, or any other aspect of your artistic life. And just to see whether this is actually something that has been important for you uh, in your professional life, I'd like to do a quick poll and we will be able to provide you with the results and ask you if you, if, you, if you have indeed found that you are facing challenges or have faced challenges of project management or mastery of digital shift. And you have a one minute to answer this question and we will give you the results. Quite interesting. Already we see, um, we haven't completely ended voting, but that three quarters of the participants in this webinar are sharing the fact that this indeed has been a challenge for them. So, 
as we say, this means that now, as a self-managing musician, you're going to be doing more than simply playing your instrument or sharing your artistic mastery, but you have a host of things that you can be doing. And so what we're going to see today is that as you acquire this entrepreneurial mindset, you will be developing a specific way of acting and of thinking. You'll take advantage of opportunities that come your way. You'll take advantage of people you run into and who provide you with uh, growing opportunities and uh, maybe even opportunities to start things. And you're going to learn how you can bring people together and bring resources together. And in so doing, you're also going to be taking some risks. So how might we uh, share this as a sort of image that would be more helpful? Um, as you can see here, in the end, you're always and foremost an artist. So you start with your strong artistic vision and project. But it is your empathy and, and your being a full member of the society in which you sit that, that makes, um, gives this meaning. Then you're going to have to understand your contexts so that if you're sitting in Cyprus or if you're sitting in Britain or if you're sitting in France, you may not have a similar situation and something that would be relevant in one place won't be relevant in another. So you have these various contexts and then you have a number of soft skills that you'll want to develop. You'll be collaborating, working with others, building your team. Um, you're going to be very flexible and open-minded, so you don't have a set idea as to what is going to happen. Um, you, may be, you maybe have to change it as it goes along. You know, the project may evolve. But then you're going to also take advantage of so-called hard skills, so your ability to manage and analyze and market, etc. And it's this, these, these skills that you're going to bring to bear in, in a dynamic relationship with the audiences uh, with which you're going to interact. Now these audiences can be virtual audiences, and we will see this later today. They can be your general public, they can be families, they can be refugees, they can be handicapped people, um, all sorts of audiences. And it's what you, together with your audience, create that will um, make for this meaningful artistic experience. So um, I hope that this sort of setting the context is helpful. And uh, Jenny is, is going to um, provide additional, uh, more concrete information, but I, before I just go on next, I'd like to ask you about whether you've had experience um, with entrepreneurial skills. Um, so here's the question. Once again, have you experienced professional opportunities where mastery of certain entrepreneurial skills would have better equipped you to succeed? And we're just going to take a minute to answer this. Well, so far, it's it appears to be have finished. Um, are there people who have not voted? It appears that you haven't all voted. All right. So what we see is at this point, it's close to half of you have indeed um, been challenged um, by the uh, lack of entrepreneurial skills in particular projects you may have wanted to uh, organize. So I'm going to pass the floor on to Jenny, and she is going to be uh, sharing with you how you make your project a reality. Hi. 
Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking through uh, some of the practical first steps in creating your own enterprise. Um, there are quite a lot of elements to this, and um, since we only have an hour, I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail on everything, um, but I will provide some uh, resources at the end that you can use for uh, further reading and to provide you with a bit of extra information. Um, I wanted to start by just giving you a bit of background um, as to where I'm coming from so that you kind of have an idea of, of my project and my background. Um, so as I said earlier on, I'm managing director of uh, a company called Drumworks. Drumworks started um, as a Barbican Guildhall creative learning program. It began in 2007 and it was fully managed and uh, funded in-house. But it grew to the point within the Barbican where it couldn't be sustainable and actually had greater potential to thrive by itself. So about four or five years ago, myself and a couple of colleagues spun it out, turned it into a community interest company, and it now operates independently. We're in a bit of a different position to a lot of startups in that the, uh, the project was already quite well established when I began work on it. But on the other hand, because it was already so big, our fundraising targets were huge to begin with. So we didn't have the opportunity to start small and build up like many startups do. Um, I came to the project with no prior knowledge at all of how to run a company and very much learned as I went along. Um, and yeah, I just had a huge passion for the project and a belief in it. And it was that that kind of drove me to learn all of the things that I have about enterprise. And actually, as I've gone along, I've started to see the potential of thinking um, with an entrepreneurial mindset and the things that that can enable you to do. Um, I'm going to share with you a very short video about Drumworks so that, um, as I say, you can kind of visualise where I'm coming from. And then I'll move on to start talking about the practical steps that were involved in setting that up. Drumworks has been here for about seven years. Drumworks is a music Drumworks project is a music built by drums, but, drums, but the, the reason behind, reason behind it is behind empowering, it. empowering social change. Social change. I've had nothing, I've had other, than nothing other than amazing experience, an amazing experience, not only with the not thing we've been, able to, thing been able to do, but with the people that, that are part of the project. The school's part the of Drumworks is really the heart of the project. Without that, none of it would exist at all. One of the One of reasons, I think, reasons so I think it's so successful is because of the quality of the, of the staff that run the project. They bring, they bring their own their own musicianship skills, 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 but they also bring, also bring maybe a different, maybe way, a of different way of approaching or working with students, or a different way of, a different way of a relationship that they can have with the students, a professional relationship that we maybe don't have with the students. Amazing, like, Amazing, doing like, what, we doing what best. we love best, and then obviously, and then obviously traveling, traveling and doing it for other crowds in different, community. different communities. And people, and people rarely, rarely see the drumming in some of the size that we have, so it's great to see that initial reaction. Wonderful, infectious, infectious powerful, powerful thing. thing. That, that I can't see why anybody, can't see why anybody would, would, would want to be part of it. Okay, sorry. I know a few of you had issues with the sound on that. Sorry about that, but um, that's us anyway. It gives you gives you an idea of, uh, of what the project is. Um, so now I'm going to go on and talk about the steps that we went through uh, towards setting that up. So this diagram here kind of very much echoes what Gretchen was saying earlier on about um, your, the core of your idea um, is where your artistry and your passion and your talents um, coincide with a need that you've identified in your surroundings and the resources that are available to you um, to enable that to happen. Um, if you've got a brilliant idea, but you don't that you haven't identified a need, or you don't have the resources available to you, then that's not going to work. Um, similarly, if you've got a brilliant uh, an idea for a commercial possibility, but you don't have the kind of innovation and creativity behind it, that also won't be sustainable in the long term either. So what it is is about finding a balance between 
your talent, your artistry, and the, uh, the context that you're operating in. A really good starting point uh, when you've got an idea for a creative enterprise is to um, really clarify uh, and get to the heart of what it is you want to do, how you're going to go about doing it, and why you want to do it. So the great thing about starting your own enterprise is that you can realize your own idea in exactly the way that you want to. Um, so it's a really good place to start by spending some time thinking about what exactly you want to achieve and what your core values are, and this will really help you to get started. So we're going to begin by looking at um, a vision statement. So your vision is um, an aspirational statement that describes the change that you want to bring about. So it's a statement of how you want the world to be as a result of what you're doing. Um, I've got a few examples here, and I'm going to do a quick poll to see um, which of these you think is most effective. So uh, if you could all vote for the, I, the, the vision statement that you think is the, the clearest and the most effective, um, We've got IKEA to create a better everyday life for the many people. We've got Oxfam, a just world without poverty. We've got Nike to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. If you have a body, you're an athlete. And the Howard League for penal reform, less crime, safer communities, fewer people in prison. So I'm just going to give you a minute or so to uh, vote for the vision that you think is the most effective, and then I will share the results with everyone. It's looking pretty even at the moment. Uh. <laughs> okay, just take the final few votes from people. Great. Okay, we'll stop there. So, um, just see if I can share that with you. There we go. Yeah, so I actually, I agree with um, the majority of you. I really like the Oxfam vision because it's so bold and inspiring and mem memorable. Um, and I think it's a really clear statement of what they're aiming for. And um, the Nike one is perhaps a bit clunky with the kind of asterisk. It's maybe kind of take some of the punch out of it. Um, but they are all, you know, they're all pretty good vision statements and they're all quite, um, quite bold. Um, so next, we're going to move on to uh, mission statements. So missions are uh, it's a bit different to the vision. So this is a summary of how you're going to achieve the vision. So it should be concise and clear and set out what exactly it is you're going to do. So again, I want to quick poll and see uh, which of these mission statements you think is the most effective. So again, here we've got one from IKEA, offering a wide range of well-designed functional home furnishing product, products at prices so low that as many people as possible will be able to afford them. We've got the Media Trust. We work with the media industry to empower charities and communities to have a voice and be heard. And then we've got um, Drumworks, our own one, which is using drumming as a tool to inspire people creatively, give them confidence in their ideas, and empower them to direct their own futures. So again, I'm just going to give you a minute to vote here for which one you think is the most effective, and then I'll share the results with you. Okay, just a final few seconds and then I'll close it and share the results. All right, great, thanks everyone. Uh, so again, uh, yeah, fairly even on this one actually. Um, I think all of these mission statements are really good. They're very clear. They kind of really give you a sense of what each of these organizations does. Obviously, I like our one because we wrote it, but um, yeah, I think they're all, they're all helpful and they're all um, useful missions. Okay, 
Next, we're going to look at values. So you might not make this public in the same way that you do with your mission and vision statement. This is more for you. So um, as an example, I've used our values at Drumworks. Uh, we are open. We actively seek to collaborate and to share ideas. We're responsive to participants' needs. Um, we're responsive to opportunities that arise, and we continually reflect on our work. We're personal, characterised by the strength of the personal connections forged at every level of the project. We're participant focused, so all participants have a voice in our creative process. And we believe in positive action, so we're driven by that belief in the importance of positive action to create change. So these, again, as I say, we don't share these publicly, but um, they are shared between ourselves and between our colleagues. And the fact that we're all behind these values and all believe in them is what makes us pull together as an organisation. The elevator pitch. So a few of you have probably uh, come across these before. And essentially, it's a way of summing up very clearly and articulately what it is you do and why it matters to the people that you're talking to. So these are really useful to have um, for uh, pitch events when you might be speaking about your project or your organisation. They're useful at networking events and um, basically any scenario where you might only have a couple of minutes to grab somebody's attention. And there's a lot of uh, kind of tips of how to structure elevated pitches online. Um, and you might want to tailor them slightly to different audiences according to who you're speaking to. But essentially, it is about um, very clearly saying in one sentence what you do and why it matters to the person that you're talking to. Ideally, you want to um, pose some kind of issue or problem and what your solution is to that problem. So you're making the need for your product very, very clear. Once you've got your, uh, your business idea clear in your mind, and you know what it is and you can articulate it, you then need to have a think about how it's going to work in a practical sense. So this business model canvas is a really useful tool for thinking about the whole, because it allows you to see how all the different elements of your business relate to each other. So you can see how, um, like what activities you need to deliver um, to meet your value propositions. You can work out what resources you need to deliver your activities. You can work out um, who your customers are and how, uh, which different revenue streams your customers will bring in. It's not linear like a business plan, it enables you to see the whole of your business model on one page. So I'm going to spend a bit of time just going through each of these headings and the things that you should think about under each one. Key activities, this is what you actually do. So it's likely that you um, do a number of these different things. It could be workshops and teaching, performances, merchandise, services like mentoring or consultancy, training and professional development or research. And it might be that some of these combine with each other as well. So for example, you might um, train up new artists to work with you by delivering workshops or you might use performances to sell merchandise. So it's useful to think about all of the things you do and how they relate to each other. Next, you've got your key resources. So this is what you need to deliver everything that you're doing. There's the really obvious practical resources like materials, instruments, transport, etc. But there's also human resources. So you're going to find you need people with a range of skills around you. Um, either as uh, colleagues or board members or advisors. Um, we've got a board of directors who work very closely with us and we appointed our board based on their different skills. So um, myself and my co-directors uh, have a certain skill set, but we needed support with accounting and with fundraising and um, we needed links into the corporate sector. So we've got people on our board who meet all of those criteria. Once you've thought through all of the resources that you have available to you, you need to think about what you need to get and where that might come from. So perhaps you can work with partners um, to find resources quite cheaply or efficiently. This brings us neatly onto types of partners. 
So partnerships are essential, particularly for startups. Um, any funders you go to will expect to see you working in partnership, especially if you're applying for public funding. Um, and there are different types of partners. Uh, some of them are essential. So if you're putting on events or performances, you'll need a venue. Some of them bring skills or resources that you don't have, a bit like our board, as I said, they bring um, their areas of expertise. Some partners are complementary, so they enable you to do work that you couldn't do by yourself and they couldn't do by themselves. And some partners minimise risk or uncertainty. So if you go into um, a financial arrangement with a partner, then you're kind of, you've both got slightly less at stake than you would if you were doing it alone. Whatever the type of partnership, it needs to be effective. So it's really important that you make sure that you've got shared objectives right from the start and that you're um, similarly committed to the product. Otherwise, uh, one partner could end up taking on all of the work and the other one could feel like a burden or you might end up achieving outcomes that you didn't want in the first place. So it's really important to be clear about what it is you're trying to achieve through your partnership. Um, as an example of this, uh, we've recently partnered with a music service who um, have a lot of music teachers that work with their young people um, and they're excellent musicians but they're a little bit unconfident about running creative composition processes and our leaders and tutors that work on drum works have a lot of experience in that area. So we're training up their teachers to um, deliver creative sessions and um, something that we need is uh, to find more people to join our team we're looking for more musicians from a variety of backgrounds to come and work with us so as we're delivering training sessions we're also meeting people whom we might want to work with so that's a real two-way partnership that's working for both sides and that's really important that both sides feel like they're gaining from the relationship Okay, so next we're going to move on to your customers. When you're thinking about who your customers are, you need to think uh, more widely than just who's engaging with the project, who's, uh, who are the beneficiaries. You need to also think about who's paying for it and who else might influence them. So for us, we work with young people, they're our beneficiaries. The schools mostly pay for the work and parents influence whether or not their children are allowed to take part in it. So we need to engage with all of those different customer segments in different ways. When you've identified who your customers are, you need to think about the types of relationship you want to have with them. So is it a one-off transactional relationship where they're buying something from you, it's quite straightforward, or it could be something longer term or more bespoke when it's more tailored to the individuals. And that will affect the ways that you engage with your different customers and how frequently you engage with them. Then you need to think about all of the points of contact along that journey. So from the first point of contact to the point where the customer decides to commit to you and to buy into what it is that you're offering. And then what do you need to do afterwards or do you need to do anything afterwards to keep engaging with them? This is an ongoing cycle. So it's a good idea to set out a marketing and communications plan that will um, lay out who your customers are, how you're engaging with each different group of customers, how often you're going to do that and why you're doing it um, so that you can stay on track with that. Okay, the final part of the business model canvas is your financial structure. So this is your income and your costs. So it's a good idea to start by setting out all of your possible income streams and all of the things that you will do that will incur costs. And then you can look at ways they might combine with each other. So for example, um, if you uh, were putting an event on in a venue, and uh, charging tickets for it, you might partner with a venue that would bring that cost down, but then you'd also maybe be sharing the cost, the, the income from the tickets and things like that. So it's important to see how those things relate to each other. And a really crucial question you need to answer here is, are you cost driven or value driven? So cost driven organisations are about um, it being very easy and hassle free for the customer. You're providing a product that's probably quite cheap and easy to produce and it's about kind of volume and quantity and making the most uh, income you can out of it. 
value-driven organisations are much more about um, tailored, bespoke, premium products that are often quite expensive. It's less about volume often and more about, um, about the value and the premium of the product. And this is a really important question that you need to ask yourself because it will affect your pricing structure, who your customers are and how you engage with them, and also how you differentiate yourself from your competition as well. So when you've got your business model fairly clear, um, you then move on to choosing the structure of your organisation. So the main options that will be open to you are um, a limited company, which is uh, the most sort of common and straightforward type of organisation to set up. Um, there's community interest company, which is what Drumworks is, and that operates in the same way as a limited company, but it has a thing called an asset lock on it, which uh, put simply means that you can't make personal profit from the organisation. Any profit you make has to be reinvested back into the uh, project for the benefit of the community that you serve. You could uh, decide to be a charity, which is a good idea if a lot of your income is coming from fundraising. Um, there's often tax efficiencies to being charitable. Um, the only thing to be wary of with charities is that the reporting requirements can be quite arduous. Um, and also, charities are technically owned and run by their trustees, so you relinquish control by handing it over to a group of trustees. Um, cooperatives are technically owned by all of their members. Uh, franchise, that's more about growth, so setting up individual franchises is a way of expanding your organisation under one umbrella. You could go into partnership with a formal partnership agreement, or you could operate as a sole trader, which I imagine a lot of you already do um, as freelance musicians. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about uh, finances, because I know that while uh, this comes naturally to some people, for others, numbers can be quite daunting, um, particularly when you're starting out. Uh, but there is no getting away from it with running a business, and so um, it's important to think it through. Um, when you're thinking about how much money you need to deliver your activity, it's really important that you consider both your direct costs and your indirect costs. So direct costs are the things you actually need to run your work. So delivery fees, transport, materials, venues, project management of the particular project you've got in mind, and marketing that's specific to that project. And your indirect costs are your overheads, basically. So your premises or office costs, your central functions like your IT and your human resources, your governance if there's a cost attached to say your board of directors or something, and your general fundraising and marketing for your organisation as a whole. So when you're thinking about the cost of a project, you have to take both of these into consideration because if you only fundraise the direct costs, then your company will fall apart. It might be possible to uh, find an economy of scale. So what this diagram is showing is if these are your indirect costs here, you can share these out between a number of different projects so that each project only has a small amount of the indirect costs attached to it. And this makes the total cost of each project slightly less. Um, so this is quite an efficient way of running and it will also help you to work out how much, how many projects you should be aiming to work on um, so that you can realistically cover all of your indirect costs and that's what will keep your organisation running. Um, when you know how much money you need to raise, obviously you need to work out where it's going to come from. And it's a really good idea to have a range of different income sources. This is the most stable and sustainable way of working. So um, it's important to do your research when you're thinking about different areas you might raise income from. If you're um, selling things commercially, you need to have a look at what your competitors are charging and do some research into what your customers are willing to pay for. If you're fundraising for grants, um, you need to know a bit about what the funding climate is like at home and um, how much you can realistically raise this way. I know in the UK at the moment only one in ten funding applications is successful 
So it's really worth fundraising, but we need to bear that in mind because it's a lot of time and a lot of research and a lot of writing that goes into writing funding applications and only a tenth of them will actually yield any results. So as I say, I would really encourage everyone to be very creative thinking about all the different places you might bring income in from. There's probably more than you think if you stop and think about it. Um, and then to try a different, a few different areas because uh, it's quite risky to just focus on one thing and it's much more stable and much more sensible to think about a range of sources. Okay, the last thing I want to say about finance is remember to think about your cash flow. So um, if you're running a project and all of your money is being spent at the beginning, but nobody's paying you until afterwards, obviously you're going to run into difficulties quite quickly. So you need to think about whether people need to pay you up front or in installments or um, whether you need to take a loan. It just needs thinking through. Um, ideally, you would have uh, reserves. But for startup organisations, that's really, really difficult. Obviously, you don't, you're not going to start out with a load of money in the bank. Um, and this is something that we struggle with still now. I mean, we've been operating independently for about a year, a year and a half. And still, if customers pay us late, it gets very difficult very quickly for us to pay our staff. And obviously, you don't want bad relations with people you're working with. So it's really important to stay on top of this. Um, What's a good idea is to, when you're setting out where uh, you think your money is going to come from and your fundraising targets, is to attach dates to those. And then you can see where the risk areas are going to be and maybe set yourself a kind of contingency plan. So you need to raise X amount of money by March, otherwise this project needs to be postponed or um, delayed. It's really important to confront these potential issues head on and just be honest with yourself about it so that you don't run into difficulties further down the line. Okay, I don't know whether any of you will have seen uh, this before or be familiar with this. We call it a SWOT analysis, which stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So doing this exercise is really helpful in terms of positioning yourself and understanding where you sit in the context that you're operating in. So uh, when thinking about your strengths, this could include the people that you work with um, and their expertise. It could be the strength of your um, artistic or creative idea, the commitment that you have to your uh, project or organisation and that the people that you're working with have. And it could be endorsements you have from other people that will help you. When you're thinking through weaknesses, this could be uh, a lack of resources, particularly if you're just starting out, lack of experience, perhaps you've never run an enterprise before, which I know was a, a thing for us. And you could have little or no track record. Again, all of these are quite common weaknesses for startups. Opportunities. So these are the contacts and the networks that are open to you that you can make use of. Um, the location you're operating in, um, you know, perhaps that offers you an opportunity. And you can look at trends within your sector as well. So um, there might be things that are happening or particular pots of money that are available that you can go for, and it's really worth staying in touch with these. And then finally, threats. So obviously competitors, it's really important to know who your competitors are and where that threat might come from. If there are changes in the funding climate, um, again, you need to be aware of those. Or could there be a health and safety incident or some other kind of incident that affects the way that your project runs or your reputation? So once you've gone through and you've identified things in each of these categories, you can then set yourself some actions against each one. So for your strengths, when you know what your strengths are, how can you enhance them and make the most of them? For your weaknesses, how can you improve these? How can you get the, uh, the resource or the experience that you need? For your opportunities, how can you make the most of them? What will you actually do? And for your threats, how can you be prepared for them? And once you've got your action points, this will really help you to think about what you need to focus on and prioritise as your organisation grows and develops. 
So I thought it would be quite helpful um, to finish uh, my part of this presentation by talking about some of the challenges that uh, I've faced in setting up uh, my enterprise. And a really major one for me at the start was having confidence in attaching a financial value to our work. So as I mentioned earlier, Drumworks started as a project that was managed and funded in-house at the Barbican. And so um, as the project manager, I'd never had to charge anybody for the work before or talk about the financial value at all. And when our funding situation changed, obviously I had to start thinking about that and talking to people about that. And that felt quite uncomfortable to begin with. But actually what I found was um, people were quite willing to have that conversation. The schools that we worked in, the vast majority of them were happy to work with us and fundraise with us because they did see a value in our work. And so now I feel much more confident about that. Um, fundraising, as I mentioned earlier, at the moment only one in ten applications is successful, so a lot of the time I'm getting rejections. And I'm working alone on fundraising as well. Uh, my co-directors are on the artistic side, so I'm the only one writing these things. And it's quite demoralizing when you get rejections through. But we have also had some successes. And obviously, the organization is still going and it is funded. So it's important not to lose heart and to just keep at it. Uh, workload, I'm sure that's going to be an issue for everybody. And it is for every startup. It's an enormous amount of work. and. You have to really care about it and believe in what you're doing. Otherwise, I don't think you know it's possible to have the drive to keep going. And then finally, capacity and resources. This is something we're really up against at the moment in terms of our growth. So our um, project is running, it's sustainable, it's working. But we really want to take it to the next level now and start expanding it. But as I say, working alone, that's very difficult. Um, and we're, we're kind of hitting a bit of a hurdle in terms of how we're going to move forward. So we're really focusing on organizational development at the moment and where we can get support in so that we can increase that capacity. There are positives as well to running a business. So as I said earlier, um, the really brilliant thing about it is you get to realize your idea in exactly the way you want to. So everything we're doing is completely in line with our values. We're achieving what we want to achieve, and we have ownership of it and um, are in control of it. And that's brilliant. Um, one thing that's really important to me is the variety in the work. So um, I'm not just sitting in an office doing the same thing every day. I'm uh, learning about fundraising and finance. And I go out and I work on the projects as well. And I find the variety in my workload really, really interesting. I've been constantly learning and growing as a person through the process. So my skill set now is uh, unrecognizable to what it was four or five years ago. And that's been really valuable. And then finally, obviously, success is incredibly rewarding. When you put so much of yourself into something you believe in and it works, it's immensely satisfying. Um, so I'm going to finish there and hand back to Gretchen, who's going to share some inspiring case studies from across Europe with you that uh, hopefully will inspire some of you to think about setting up your own creative enterprise. Yes, um, so briefly I'm going to share four or five stories from different parts of Europe and different kinds of stories, uh, different kinds of organizations. Um, and I'm not going to do this in a terribly detailed way um, uh, by comparison with the detailed presentation you just had from Jenny, but I think you're more than welcome to look further at what each of these uh, groups has achieved. So um, Central Europe, Collegium 1704 and Collegium Vocal. Here. Um, this started in 2005 under the aegis of the Prague Spring Festival, and uh, it was the brainchild of Vaclav Nux, who was a horn player who studied in um, Switzerland and Germany because he was unable to find the kind of training he was looking for in his home country, but he was always um, intent on coming back 
to the Czech Republic to create something special around uh, Baroque music that would be based on music from, from, from the Czech Republic. So these were his goals. We've talked about values and, and mission and vision to revitalize early music in the Czech Republic, to create new opportunities for Czech musicians, to make Prague a top destination for Baroque music lovers, and to create a, a family, a, a, a self-governing ensemble. And um, I can say that he's been incredibly successful. Um, the ensemble now tours Europe regularly. And uh, when asked why they thought they were successful, among some of the areas cited, which come back to our earlier um, diagram about entrepreneurial skills, were their knowledge of languages. And he and his business manager speak several languages between them and have networks in different countries. So his business manager knows France very well, and he knows Germany very well. So he's been able to establish a bridge with Dresden, and uh, the ensemble performs regularly in French festivals, their communication skills. They were very, of course, they had a, a keen understanding of their own particular uh, socioeconomic and cultural context. Um, they were able to collaborate and, and reflect, and they were savvy as business people, strategic and analytic. That means that they didn't try to do everything at once, but one step at a time. And they also were dreamers. They had a capacity to dream and invent and take risks. And so just to give you a quick taste of what that would be like. Sorry. It's a little bit tricky here. I'm hoping to do the right thing. So that was just to give you a, a flavor uh, of what they what they sound like, and um, Vaclav Lux has really been extremely charismatic in developing the project. Um, it's very inspiring. Now, going uh, farther south in in Europe, this is just a very new project, uh, which has only been up and running for one year. Uh, this is a project. Uh, of music uh, being used as a form of social inclusion for refugee children in Greek and European society. And this was born in 2016 uh, when a volunteer working in Lesbos saw that there were many, many children who were uh, completely without anything to do. There were no educational activities. And uh, he was. Um, he knew very well the Venezuelan El Sistema uh, project, and it occurred to him that he could create um, a project with music pedagogical, musically pedagogical activities that would help um, these children uh, have a sense of belonging and begin to integrate European society. And their future projects will include Greek children. Um, if you go on to their website, you can learn more about some of the specific uh, projects they've developed. But they have um, reached several thousand migrant children already in camps in Athens and on Lesbos. And as I say, they're going to expand and work with Greek children in um, disadvantaged neighborhoods. Now moving all the way across to the north and west of Europe, just a few words about the Red Note Ensemble in Scotland, which was founded by the composer John Harris and the cellist Robert Irvine in 2008. And their point of departure, which once again is looking at a context and what seems realistic and, and uh, important for where they are, 
was the virtually total absence of contemporary music in Scotland, uh, in Scotland's classical programming, and uh, this, the significant uh, cultural, educational, and geographic challenges which hampered access to participation in and development of this art form. So their idea was that they didn't want to be fossils anymore, literally, that they wanted to be bold, and they created several strands, a performance strand, developing, commissioning, performing new music, and they do this in very innovative ways. So for example, they have a project uh, in bars, this is also access, this access patient strand uh, where they will uh, make a call for projects uh, online and people can can write pieces and then come to a specific bar for example and hear their piece performed uh, and this I'm uh, I'm sharing with you this statement which uh, which I think is uh, which is very, um, which speaks to really who they are and uh, cultivating a healthy, jovial attitude and great respect to audiences while maintaining an outward looking Scottish identity. So here are their noisy nights. And we're going to hear just a brief excerpt from A Thousand Airplanes on the Roof. Uh, to give you an idea of the way they've used um, site-specific places to interest new audiences in contemporary music. And you, I would never return to my to world, world. Again. again. I swear to you, I would have been a queen. A spaceship, a spaceship at, least at least should be clean. Should be clean. So that just gives you a flavor for, for what they do. And um, from their local beginnings, the ensemble has expanded internationally and have initiated several, they have initiated several European co-productions. Um, now, moving to a very different um, initiative, which is about three or four years old now. This is uh, the brainchild of two women in France. One is a sound engineer, Hannah-Laure Gatté, and another one is a cultural administrator, Clotilde Chalot. And they recognized that classical music was notoriously absent from digital platforms. So they actually um, worked to develop a new uh, distribution system that would open classical music to new audiences while inviting classical audiences to explore the worlds of jazz and world music. So this is what they've been able to do. They've created a uh, an independent record label, an online webzine, digital residencies, and participative apps. So um, people can do composition. There are apps that are for composers. Um, there are ways in which audiences can respond online. And this is just to give you a sense of the kinds of groups that they have fostered and the kind of image that they are trying to share, which is quite a different one from what we think of when we think of classical music. So by way of conclusion, what do these stories tell us? Well, we'd like to encourage you to dream, invent, be authentic and true to who you are. Look outside the box, be inspired by your context, and we see these um, different examples. Each one did it in a in a specific way, listen to your world, which is a very special world, and understand its specificities. Put the audience at the heart of your story. And as always, the success will depend on artistic excellence and excellence in delivery. 
So now I am going to give the floor back to Jenny, who's going to share with you a final assignment, and then we will be happy to answer your questions. Thanks, Gretchen. Um, so hopefully, uh, yeah, my uh, presentation and Gretchen's inspiring case studies there have given you a few ideas about how you might go about setting up your own enterprise. And as a follow-up assignment, um, while all of this is still fresh in your minds, we thought it would be great for you guys to um, create your own business model canvas that outlines your idea, your key activities, your resources, your partners, etc. Um, just as a kind of whether or not you decide to go through with it as an exercise uh, to think through how a business might work. And we will provide a template for this that will be sent around to you that you can all fill in. I also said um, at the start of my presentation that I would um, give you some further resources that you might want to look at. And there are two here that I think are brilliant, which are the Creative Enterprise Toolkit by Nesta and a website called Thinkit. And both of these are great and they go, um, they're both free resources, you can access them and they go into a lot of detail on all of the different elements um, you need to do to set up your own creative business. So if you actually are going to, um, to, to try your hand at this, uh, they're really valuable resources. Um, and I know in the UK as well, there are loads of other things, lots of other free help out there and you can find a lot online by just having a look. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of our presentation and um, if any of you have any questions at all that you'd like us to answer, then please do uh, uh, type them into the chat box and uh, yeah, we'll be happy to take questions. We're glad to see that uh, Mariana finds this informative and inspiring. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and uh, we hope it also really gives you that extra nudge um, that allows you to go out there and, and start working on making your project a reality. Please feel free to, to <laughs> ask questions. We're here for that. <laughs> or maybe you'd like to share a possible idea um, and, and ask uh, how if there are some thoughts we might have on how to get started. I can see some people typing. Where is oh, thank you. Thanks, Asmit. We're glad that you've enjoyed this. We have a lot of, and we've enjoyed it too. <laughs> yeah, it's been a good exercise. Yeah. It's quite nice to take a step back and actually uh, go back over some of the things um, that we've done in the past. Okay, I started a private and it is working. Um, but I will certainly use Jenny, Jenny's ideas. Great. Oh, great. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got a few questions coming in now. Um, what was... How do you usually choose your stakeholders or funders? Okay. Um, well, actually, do you know what? I'm going to run through the questions in order. So there was one a little earlier that said, uh, what was our biggest challenge when looking for sponsors? Um, it's, it's very difficult to um, engage with people uh, from the cold. So it's um, the biggest challenge is probably looking for a way in in the first mm -hmm. place. And so that's kind of where our board of directors comes in and not being afraid to use them uh, to open doors for us was quite a, a quick thing that we learned at the start of this process. Because otherwise we're just three random people asking people that don't know us to support us and it doesn't really work. But um, if you can get a way in, then uh, yeah, then that's great. I, I would add, I'm uh, on the board of an innovative uh, chamber music project in Paris and it's just started in the last year or so and um, one of the challenges is also demonstrating value to something that doesn't really have a storyline or hasn't really existed and and yet has great potential and 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 it does definitely have upfront costs as jenny has explained here so um that's where sometimes it's helpful to have some angels who come in some people who you have convinced 
uh, from the very start that this is a worthwhile project and who can either speak to it um, when you go see other potential sponsors or provide you with with a little nest egg to get started. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a thought. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good one. Um, also, I mean, one way we really benefited, obviously, was because we'd had the support from the Barbican to start with. We already had something to talk about. And I know from um, friends and colleagues of mine who started smaller organisations from scratch, um, that sometimes if you can pull some friends together and do something for free or very low cost, just to prove what it is you can do, just to run a pilot, um, to have something that you can show and talk about, that can sometimes really help get off the ground with other uh, funders and investors further down the line. I think that we can tie this to the next question about mm. choosing your stakeholders and funders. And I think this also allows us to come back to the question of, of your network. Um, because obviously, um, I mean, obviously we have to have do, do research and we have to know um, whether there are funders that are interested in specific types of activities and whether um, I, I've talked to people who've told me stories of um, cases where people have not paid attention to, to what the uh, mission of a particular organization is and they've just come out of the cold or they've tried to get um, funding and, and it's been totally irrelevant. But I think that we can also um, once again um, make use of our networks and, and find out that you know that there are people we may not know but who through two or three people related um, could be interested if if you if there's an opportunity to make the case to them. Mm, yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, and I, you know, I think it's also good to look at what um, funders are funding elsewhere. Yes. Okay, what's this? Right now, I'm not charging money for it yet, but everyone keeps telling me I should. I feel all I want is to change people's lives. I mean, asking money for it would ruin that. That really resonates with um, my experience with Drumworks, for sure. Um, one thing I didn't really mention about uh, our organisation is we do specifically target young people facing challenging circumstances. So often they're from uh, quite difficult, um, deprived backgrounds. So there's no question of asking them to, you know, them to pay themselves. Um, but uh, that's not to say that the work doesn't have a value to it. Obviously, there are costs involved and there is value in what you're doing. So it's finding the right way to fund it, basically. Um, and you can't shy away from it because you're not going to change anybody's lives if you don't raise the money to do what it is you want to do. So um, we found that, uh, obviously, as I said, we're working in schools and sometimes schools with the most, um, with a lot of young people from very deprived backgrounds aren't necessarily the poorest schools or they might have links with um, corporate sponsors or supporters and there's money to be obtained that way. Um, we also, uh, we have a thing in the UK called pupil premium funding. I don't know if you have similar things elsewhere, but that's where um, young people who are from difficult backgrounds have an amount of money that goes to the school to support enrichment opportunities for them. And again, that's money we can access. So I think, um, I think your instinct in terms of not necessarily charging the people that are benefiting from your work is probably a good one. Um, but think about who else the work is benefiting and where the money might come from. Um, and also if there are other things you can do that could bring money in. So we run um, corporate training, for example, that's quite lucrative and we charge a, you know, a big profit on that. And that profit that we make will support the work we do with more needy groups of participants. So it might be you can do um, you can deliver the work that you're good at doing for different groups of people and bring in money that way as well. I hope that's helpful. So we are still more than happy to answer your questions. Please feel free to type them in. Um, okay, so thank you. Great. Okay, glad that was helpful. Just going back up at the top yeah. to see if we've missed anything. Um, 
So if we have not, if, if you don't have any further questions, we are going to close this webinar. Do you yeah. have a further um, last no, I word? Think, no, I think we have And um, oh, we've got a private chat. We might have a question come in. Just want to comment. Oh, we've got, a new, we've got a new question. Okay. Let's go on to the main chat. And let's go right down. Okay. Okay. An umbrella organization for schools could. Sorry, we're having a bit of difficulty. Oh, there we go. Could. An umbrella organization for schools. Oh, it could be a good point to develop a network then? Yeah, for sure. Um, Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, in to use our experience, there are some of the schools we work in are linked together under one trust or one academy. We have academies in this country that are linked together um, under one kind of uh, yeah trust organisation that um, that operates all of them centrally. So uh, that can be quite effective because once you've got one school running and the people in charge of the purse strings see that working then they're more likely to bring you into other schools that they're related to. Is that what you meant? It seems that that's what... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a really good point. Mm -hmm. And also we, again, I don't know how it works in every individual place, but um, we have music services for each borough in London where I'm based. And so those music services have an overview of um, the music activity of all of the young people that are in their particular local area. And so getting to know the music service is really important for us because that is a way into understanding where the needs are in that borough and where we should be targeting to. Good. I'm we're still happy to entertain questions if you have any further thoughts and if not we hope you will take advantage of the resources um, that are listed here and we really encourage you to go through the exercise of the assignment we're suggesting as a helpful a really helpful starting point and we want to make sure that you are already making a note of next week's webinar with Nenad Bogdanovic on finding your place in the value chain for increased competitiveness and sustainability. So with that, I think we're going to say goodbye. And thank you so much for your attention. And we hope this was helpful. Yes, thanks, everyone.